happy Triple Hero Thursday, everyone, where we've got videos on all three JG9 media channels dropping today. We dropped a video earlier today on JG9 about something in the NFL, and we're dropping a video later tonight about something in college football over on JG8. Click the links in the description to subscribe to both of those channels now. And now, on with our feature presentation. This player right here is Dave Magadan, and he went on to have a very successful career in Major League Baseball, playing a whopping 16 seasons in the big leagues. When you play that long at baseball's highest level and make just under 5,000 plate appearances, you're clearly doing something right. You might remember him as a member of a bunch of different teams, seeing as he made seven stops throughout his career. But in all likelihood, you remember him as a member of the New York Mets, which is where he spent the bulk of his time, playing seven of his 16 seasons in Flushing. There, he even had a 1990 season where he not only finished third in batting average in the National League by hitting 328, only behind Willie McGee of the St. Louis Cardinals and Eddie Murray of the Los Angeles Dodgers, but even got some votes for the MVP of the National League. He actually finished higher in the voting that year than guys like Brett Butler of the San Francisco Giants did, and he led the NL in hits. But after his time in New York, Madden had found himself on a different NL East team, and a team that didn't even exist when he came into the league. Because in 1993, he found himself a member of the expansion Florida Marlins. Now, if there's one thing that Magadan is not, and has never been throughout his career, it's a home run hitter. Despite taking just under 5,000 plate appearances and playing in just under 1,600 games, Magadan never really got the ball out of the yard, as he only hit 42 home runs in his career. That just wasn't a strength of his. His best season in home runs was 1990, when he hit six. But baseball is a funny sport. Baseball has a weird way of teasing you sometimes. Because even though Magadan is by no means a home run hitter, in 1993, while playing for the Marlins, he hit what had to be, considering the circumstances, the most controversial home run in franchise history. Roughly one month into the history of the Marlins, they already had a home run that would be tough to top and still hasn't been topped 30 years later for just how bizarre and controversial it was. Because this is the story behind what might just be the most controversial home run in the history of the Marlins. Before I talk about the home run in question and everyone's reaction to the play, we need some context to understand how the game was going, as well as the importance of this game. It's May 2nd, 1993. And we have not just any game, but an expansion battle between the Florida Marlins and the Colorado Rockies over at Joe Robbie Stadium. Even though this was only one game out of 162 in the beginning of May, this was a big game for the Marlins nonetheless. Number one, this was the first time ever that they were playing in prime time on ESPN, as this was the Sunday night baseball game, their Sunday night debut. For many people, this was going to be the first time ever that they would watch the Marlins play a game. So you want to make a good first impression. Number two, this was the final game of a three-game series between the teams, with Colorado having taken the first game 6-2 on Friday, and the Marlins responding by winning 7-6 in 12 innings after a walk-off single by Rick Ranceria. But number three, in many ways, this felt like the biggest game in the short history of the Marlins at the time simply because of the perception surrounding the team. Even though ESPN was broadcasting this game, they were already going into the game having something to prove, because neither play-by-play -play man John Miller nor color commentator Joe Morgan had nice things to say about the Marlins before this one. Miller criticized the minor league feel of the Marlins with their atmosphere, and in particular, their public address announcer, Jay Rokich by saying on the way he pronounces names and calls guys up to the box, the players hear that and just cringe. It affects them. It's almost like they feel they're being shown up. Go ahead and shoot off fireworks. Use a laser light show, but don't make it seem like the Bush Leagues, because everything about this place is big time. This is not the Miami Hurricanes or the Chattanooga Lookouts. And then, Morgan felt as though the Marlins even though they had a better record than the Rockies, 
were a poorly constructed team with no real vision, saying, The Rockies did more like I would have done. Florida took a lot of young players. The young players do not always make it in the major leagues. I would have taken the best available players. Florida calls themselves planning for the future, but you can't do that. You're playing right now. In other words, this game, even though it was just one out of 162, truly felt like a statement game for the Marlins in more ways than one, especially since ESPN was giving that entire franchise no respect whatsoever. Anyone who watched this battle of the expansion teams was treated to a highly competitive, albeit very low scoring game. The Marlins took a one-run lead in the fifth inning, with Benito Santiago singled to right field, bringing in Chuck Carr in the process. However, the Rockies took their first lead of the game in the top of the eighth inning, when with two outs, Alex Cole hit a line drive single up the middle, bringing in the runners from second and third. Why the Marlins left Jack Armstrong in the game in the first place, after he allowed back-to-back -back hits and had already thrown over 100 pitches, I'm not sure as it was definitely a questionable managerial decision on the part of Renee Latchman. However, either way, the Marlins now trailed 2-1 entering the bottom of the eighth inning. They were running out of chances to tie this game, take the series, and be within one game of 500 for the first time since they were 2-3 after five games. Back-to-back -back outs to start off the inning didn't help matters much, but they had one more chance in the eighth to salvage something. Enter this guy right here. Dave Magadan. Earlier in the season, Magadan wasn't playing so hot. Over the first five games, he had just two hits and 17 at-bats, hitting 118, as one of the staples in the Mets lineup for years was awfully cold. But after struggling to find his footing at first down in South Beach, he emerged over the next three weeks as one of the hottest hitters in baseball, as in Florida's last 18 games before this one, he was hitting 361 with an incredible on-base percentage of 513. By this point, he was arguably the best player on the team, and the top hitter in the lineup, and he already had a hit earlier in this game, when he singled to center field in the bottom of the second in his first at-bat. Now, all the pressure was on him, this late in the game, to get that second hit, and to get on base. Again, Magadan was never a power hitter, and over the first month of the season with the Marlins, only hit one home run, which you saw about 30 seconds ago against the Atlanta Braves. So nothing changed there. But little did he know that when he stepped up to the batter's box, that he was about to hit his second, and was about to tie this ball game up. Sort of. Because what you're about to watch has to be the most controversial home run in the history of the Marlins franchise, both at the time and 30 years later. Roll the tape. Whack deep in the right center. Way back there. Is it a home run? No. It is not a home run. A double for Magadan. And also close to a home run. Magadan is not so sure. He thought it was out. He's asking. The Ryan, umpire. Ryan Gorman, the second base umpire, immediately signaled that the ball was in play. There's Brian Gorman. Let's have another look at it here. It's a line drive, hard hit. Now watch, Bichette goes back. Oh, that's a home run. I think that ball was gone. Yep, but instead, it was ruled a double, as the crew ruled that it stayed in the yard and hit the top of the wall. Remember, there was no instant replay back in 1993. So if we had instant replay, obviously, this play would have been reversed. However, because of the umpire's blown call, the call on the field stood, and this was ruled a double for Magadan. It was his second hit of the game, but it should have been a lot more than that. Not only did the ball go over the yellow line, but he hit the staircase in the stands and hit the railing at the perfect angle so that it would bounce back onto the field in the manner that it did. By all accounts, this should have been an easy call. This should have been a home run, and this should have been a tie ball game at two apiece. Instead, Magadan was standing at second, 
and was left stranded at second after Jeff Conine hit a fly ball into deep left field. And on national TV, in their ESPN debut on Sunday Night Baseball, with everything to prove, they lost by that same scoreline, losing the game 2-1, losing the series to the Rockies, and falling to seven and a half games back of the lead in the NL East. And after the game, you can bet that all the talk was about the blow hole seen around the country, and what should have been Magadan's second home run of the season, and quite possibly, the biggest one of his career. Oddly enough, we're going to start with what Frank Desmond had to say about the play. He didn't play for either one of the teams. He's not on a roster. But rather, he was the 36-year-old manager of a rail car company who even played collegiate baseball, who was sitting in section 127 of the stadium and had a chance to catch this ball. He was beating himself up afterwards for not catching this ball, since if he caught it, it would have definitely been a home run, since it wouldn't have had a chance to bounce back. As Desmond said, how can I miss it? If I catch it, it's a win. No doubt it was out. But if I catch it, then it's a home run for sure. It would have been obvious. That's why I feel so bad. I should have caught it. Fortunately for him, this was the last time ever during a Marlins game that a fan was involved in a controversy regarding catching a baseball. As for the people on the field, Bruce Froning, the crew chief, said that there was never any doubt in his mind that this was a double and not a home run, saying on the play, the ball hit the top of the yellow on the fence. It has to go over the fence for it to be a home run. I went out on instinct because I knew it was going to be a controversial play. I saw yellow all the way. I watched the ball right into it. No word on whether or not he got an eye test after this game. Manager Renee Latchman blamed the call on the stadium itself, saying, this is what happens at ballparks where fans have a chance to reach over. And while the Rockies, who were obviously biased, believed that the call made by the first base umpire was the correct one, with right fielder Dante Bichette saying, it wasn't a home run, I saw it the whole way, Magadan was obviously stunned by this development, saying on the play, I can't hit a ball any better than that. I thought I hit it good enough to get it out. It took a couple of replays to tell what really happened. Either way, this play and this blown call cost the Marlins the game, and spoiled their ESPN Sunday Night Baseball debut in front of the millions of people watching on TV, as well as the over 41,000 fans who packed the stadium that night for this momentous occasion. But what's odd about this blown call is that up until this, it's sort of been lost throughout baseball history. Seriously, unless you remember watching this, or you're a super diehard Marlins fan with that incredible memory, you likely don't even remember that this play happened. It had no impact on the season whatsoever. If the Marlins won this game with Magnin tying it up, they would have been 65-97. and 97. So even though it would have felt big at the time, it meant nothing in the grand scheme of things. And if you Google Dave Magnin controversial home run, this is the first page of results. Nothing pops up. Even if we specify it to say Marlins home run, and I zoom out all the way to the smallest Rebel font possible, nothing pops up. This play, despite its controversy, and despite being on national TV for the whole country to see, is lost history in many ways. However, when you see the replays, and even when you watch it in real time, you know that someone screwed up big time. The Marlins have played over 4,600 games at the time of this video, but it was a game that took place right at the start of their inaugural season that gives rise to the most infamous home run in franchise history, and will likely continue to be now that instant replay is a thing, and would be able to overturn that in a heartbeat. Dave Magadan didn't last long with the Marlins. He never played another game for the team after the 1994 season, and even got traded away from the team in the middle of the 1993 season. But he will forever be known in the teal and white for hitting the most controversial home run, or rather, non-home run, in franchise history. Get your official JG9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like and subscribe, as it really helps the channel out a lot.
Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of the NFL, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 9. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See so how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.